Okay, our, ne our next speaker is, um, is Terrence McNamara from uh, Fishers Island. And how many people here have been to Fishers Island? Raise your hands. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, it's a pretty magical place. It's a spot we forget is part of Suffolk County and the town of Southold. And uh, Terrence is going to talk about some of the unique features of that island. Thanks, Terrence. Hi. I'm Terry McNamara. I was a, a uh, high school teacher in Comac, math and physics, for all my career from, say, the 1970s onward. And as a result, I was lucky enough to be able to go to Fisher's Island and live there for, ever, for the oh. summer. Many times I've been on the uh, Cross Island Ferry going from Orient into New London, Connecticut. And as you enter the Thames River, and you look south, you see, actually, Base Rock Light and a, a certain amount of land. And many times I've heard people musing as to what could that possibly be. Well, of course, certainly what it is, is Fisher's Island. Now, Fisher's Island is a very small island. It's 4.2 square miles. I chose this picture, which is a winter scene, looked at from the uh, east. And the lighter areas there represent either ponds or the two golf courses or grasslands. Everything else is heavily, heavily forested. Now, Mike was nice enough when he came to Fisher's Island, seeing where the river otters were coming from that were approaching the east end, to give us these distances. Fisher's itself is really 1.9 miles from the mainland, either Naptree Point in Rhode Island or Noank in uh, Connecticut. Now, the only way to get to Fisher's Island is to take a ferry from New London, and you would arrive at the West End all the way down to your, uh, I guess it would be your left, or you can take a boat from Noank, which are only passenger ferries, which will get you there to West Harbor. Well, anyway, these are some of the animals that actually do swim over to Fisher's Island. We have, every year we have otters, but, and the otters go anywhere on the island they want. They're in the middle of town, in the duck pond, all the way to the east end, which is very sparsely uh, occupied. The beavers come only about, through the records we have, every eight years. Fisher's Island is divided into two parts, a west end where most of the people live and an east end which is a pro owned by a private corporation and there's a gatehouse and you have to have a sticker to get through. And this poor beaver obviously got, is on the road just past the gatehouse, he was turned away. <laughs> now, uh, that was in 2019 I believe. Of course, we also find a lot of animals on the beach who swim and don't make it but some of them come right up. All right, now, here are the major features. We have 39 miles of uh, coastline. We've got an airport, two golf courses, one of which, the one on the east end, is actually rated in the top 10 in the United States. We have uh, 23 ponds of brackish or freshwater ponds. We have a whole variety. The green areas represent the land trust areas that we manage or own. It rep we represent, we have control of about 13% of the island. All right, Fishers itself is part of the same moraine as Orient, and it has roads on the east end, which is the large end all the way to the left, and a single road runs up the other end of the island. And as I said, there's no access unless you have a sticker, but there is a, a very, very nice eight foot wide bike path that runs between the two golf courses that anyone can use. Okay, here's an aerial view to give you an idea of what the place looks like. And as you can see, it's mostly forested and the uh, west end is actually, as I said, where the year round population, most of them live. Now it has a year round population of 250 people, 200, actually the last census, 235 people but we do maintain a full-time school, K through 12, 
under all the regulations in New York State. And in the summer, the population runs up to about 2,500. Now, one of the most outstanding features about the island is it's surrounded by seagrass, eelgrass, actually. Now, the eelgrass around Fisher's Island represents 98% of the field grass that is still alive, of the eelgrass that is still alive in New York State. It also represents 20% uh, of the eelgrass that is still extant in uh, Long Island Sound. And we get all sorts of visitors to that. You can see, uh, this is one of my favorites. The, the, a woman was out and got this, fell, saw this fellow on a, uh, when she was on a paddle board and, and then called me, but I looked and looked and looked and I was unsuccessful. But the mint green areas show where the uh, eelgrass grows around the island. But one of our best creatures that we have is this little fellow, which is a mink. Now, the way Fisher's Island is, is structured is it's really easy to find and see all the animals. Everything is accessible. So we get to see a lot of the animals. And this one, which arrived about eight years ago, is really a fun creature. Now, they're often seen swimming in, the do in Darby's Cove, that's I, I was a picture I took. At the ferry dock, you can also see them hunting along the rocks around Silver Eel Cove. And on the South Beach, you can often see them coming out of the water with fish in that, which is very interesting. Now, the reality of it is, you get to see them, these things. This, is all, this almost all occurs on the West End. The East End is very heavily uh, forested, so it's much more difficult to see them. There you see them crossing the road you know, with their cute little leaping things as they stalk and kill rabbits and things. They're tremendously aggressive, but they're also good prey items for some other animals. Now, what we noticed at the Fishers Island Museum, this is a, a picture of it, is that uh, we had this tremendous amount of uh, information, but all our fauna generally <laughs> existed as uh, taxidermied specimens. We had 100, we have 150, I believe, bird specimens. And that didn't, you know, that doesn't translate well to explain to people what's going on about the island. So I decided to look through the archives, though we have extensive archives, and I came upon these pictures. We're very big on birds. We have all sorts of uh, information on our website. We have a, a group of, dedicated group of birders that takes an assessment every month, and then we collate it, publish it. Ed Horning, who's shown here in this photo right to the right side, was a science teacher at the only science teacher, incidentally, at the high school, at the K-12 through school on the island. But he was a dedicated naturalist. And he, he took rec he kept records from 1940 to almost 2000. And he kept detailed records, a really tremendous effort. Okay. I also noticed these pictures, which, because I wanted to give you an idea of what the island looked like. Now, from 1640, when it was first given away, through 1925, it was only used for sporting and farming. So this is what it looks like. It was often, uh, uh, the biggest comparison they make is it was just like if you've been to Ireland, it's just rock walls and fields. There was nothing else. But the people who owned it, who were very affluent, they spent most of their time hunting. And then in 1925, the Sportsman's Club closed. But I, I came upon this picture. Now, this was taken in the fall during one of the uh, migrations. If you'll notice, those are all hawks. There's a big pile in front of them. And there's a whole bunch also on the rear wall. Now, this is what they did in the off season. And, th and then, of course, I don't know if I was lucky or not, but I hit the rest of the article. So it turns out that one of the gentlemen there published an article in this particular journal, which is uh, the equivalent of Field and Stream back around in, the, uh, in 1919. And he explained how they hunted hawks. Now, I notice he turned it down. This is Harry L. Ferguson by saying that this is a way to photograph them. But I think the picture tells a different story. The way they did it 
is they would either take a live owl and put them on top of a pole or a stuffed doll rigged as a puppet and put a little kid on the floor on the ground to move his head and arms and all the hawks would just, and crows, which were also a really annoying animal according to them, and would actually just shoot as many as they could. Great sport. In fairness, you know, they maintained that whole end of the island with ducks and pheasant and hares so that they would have them to hunt all the time. And they were really sort of just, I would say, protecting their uh, investment. But finally, I guess in uh, 1925, the reason the hunting stopped is that they decided to make this a, a rich person's uh, residential area. And so no one could hunt there anymore as they actually wound up, they created a golf course and produced 250 homes. This is another one of our animals that we have a lot of. The coyotes, we've been learning a lot about them. They're rarely seen, you know, but we first knew they were on the island because every time the noon whistle went off, you could hear them howling. And concurrently, we had a problem with feral cats at that time. And the one thing we noticed that once the coyotes showed up, the feral cats almost completely disappeared. Now, actually, when, when scat was collected and analyzed, and you didn't have to be a, a geneticist to figure it out, there were hairs all over the place, that, that's where all the cats went. You know, a tabby cat, an orange cat, there aren't a lot of animals that have that kind of fur. But regardless, but anyway, but the coyotes who were doing quite well, and obviously not all of them made it, swimming over, they made some mistakes. Uh, you know, in addition to the cats, they tend to have a taste for small dogs. And they, they made the mistake of taking the wrong person's small dog. So two years into their occupancy, they took the small dog and uh, I guess everyone took exception, and then that winter we had a big snowfall, number of snowfalls as well, and I guess the combination of anger and the snowfalls on a four square mile island making it easy to track everything, they eliminated every coyote. But the end of the part of the story was that come the next spring, when the noon whistle blew, they were howling again. We've learned a lot about them. We also had very odd things that I was never aware of is that on our golf course, we have a very nice uh, superintendent, and he plants vegetables at, at every tee. And then the watermelons started to disappear one time. And we thought it was, of course, kids or raccoons or something. So we put up a camera, and of course, who turns out to really love watermelon but coyotes? So, and this, of course, is right in the West End where everyone lives. It's not like it's an isolated place. Okay, we have some of the local residents. We have muskrat. We have uh, the eastern cottontails. We have raccoons. We have white-footed mice, squirrels, bats, deer. But the deer, are, uh, you know, these are the rem. This is where the, how you generally see the deer, because it apparently it's hypothesized that they're so exhausted from swimming over that they just pass away. The good side of that, though, is that there are no deer ticks on uh, Fisher's Island. Okay, we also have, during the winter, a large number of seals. Hopefully, they won't stick around during the summer and we become like Cape Cod. This is the west end of the island. Now, on the left is how it currently looks. And at around the turn of the century, that's uh, 1900, the Spanish-American War uh, caused the Fergusons, who owned the entire island, to sell a good portion of it, or 216 acres on the farthest west end, to the uh, U.S. government, who produced an amazing base with all sorts of gun pits and, and, air, and things. And then as it progressed over the years through World War II, they produced a blimps and an airport and everything else. And then in 1950, they decided to abandon it. And that's where we are now, because when they abandoned it, the ferry district, which is a, a municipal utility, pretty much, because they have first uh, dibs, they were able to buy it, 
and then so now we have these amazing wide open fields and an entire south beach that uh, that is both maritime beach and intertidal this place has so many birds and things in it that um, two we have two expert birders who come over all the time from Connecticut and getting on the morning ferry which gets them there at about 8.30 and leaving at 4.30 in the afternoon during that time when a walk through the West End they're able to actually uh, record over 80 different bird species every month they've done it it's, it's a pretty remarkable thing now the uh, the ospreys are ever present throughout the island. We have a pretty good, pretty good population for the size we are. Right in the middle of town is a duck pond where you can see all the happy turtles. And that's also where the otter likes to hang out when he comes sometimes. And on the south beach is where we have, generally speaking, uh, all sorts of birds breeding. Even though when people first did the island, they filled all the ponds. Eventually we got other ponds. It's it's a complex problem, but we have one thing you can see all the time on Fisher's Island is the wading birds. Like right in that pond in the middle of town, we have the green herons breeding and nesting. And then in the ferry district and the in Silverio Pond, you can even almost always see um, a black crowned night heron. And in the marshes, which are all over, you also see the yellow crowned. We have the biggest Waiter, we have, of course, is the uh, blue heron here enjoying a bullfrog. Okay, we also have the, the two, you know, obli obligatory egrets, the great egret and the uh, snowy egret. Notice the yellow feet. That's how you tell them apart as they fly by. We have two owls that are resident, two owl species. One is the barred owl, which is the old fellow who always goes, who cooks for you, with his call. And they're all over the place. And there's actually one that lives right behind the museum in the woods. And we also have uh, the great horned owls, which nest wherever they like and do whatever they like. Quite often, when they nest in the woods, when I walk through the trails in the woods, I, I actually see, you know, ospreys. The young ospreys are pretty dumb. And they'll go near the nest and wind up having their heads ripped off. Okay, on the south beach, you hear the some of the species. We have a lot of uh, shorebirds like the spotted sandpiper there, but the oyster catchers and that thing in the bottom is a least tern with a child with a baby and the piping plover all nest there. And they also nest further up the island on some of the other sandy beaches. And of course we always have ever present in all sorts of places the osprey. I put this one picture in on the left because it was interesting. I was caught just going into the water with his talons, ready to do a little bit of damage. You know, we have a good population of a red-tailed hawk. Here's one enjoying a, a mink. Uh, and then um, in the salt pond just behind the, uh, the south beach, there's a least turn about to enter the water to catch a fish. Happily now, we don't have to taxidermy everything to keep track of it. What we use now is eBird, which is one of, really the penultimate uh, way to keep track of all the species of birds in any area. You know, all these dedicated birders enter the sites all the time, and we've entered all our records from Fishers Island on there as well. We have, uh, right, as you can see, 272 uh, species that visit the island. Though usually in a, in a regular year, we only record about 180. All right, we also have a good variety of herps that like to put in appearances everywhere. The, the best one, the one, my favorite, and the most beautiful is, is the black racer. You know, at this time of year, because it's, it's cold, they're slow, and so they're easy to find, mm -hmm. laying about in the fields trying to warm up so that they can do whatever they do to the poor mice. So, and in fact, I was at my house and I, <laughs> and I got out of the car and I have an Alberta spruce and uh, there was one sticking his head out at shoulder level at me. We also have three other type of snakes. We have garter snakes, ring neck snakes. Garter snakes you see all the time. The ring neck snakes you'd have to turn over a rock because he's so tiny he's really sort of a food item. And then along the ponds we also see uh, 
the eastern ribbon snakes. We have a number of turtles, especially this time of year, we have our big snapping turtles wandering around, changing venues. We have a huge number of uh, eastern painted turtles. We have spotted turtles, which we just incidentally established as still being on the island thanks to the uh, New York Heritage Program, who did a complete assay of our of our properties and everything living there. We also have a number of diamondback terrapins, which actually spend their time in the, uh, some of the brackish ponds. And we also have eastern box turtles. As far as the other herps, we have green frogs, bullfrogs, say small uh, four-toed salamanders, and everywhere we have spring peepers. We also have a, a migration to our vernal ponds of a number of uh, spotted salamanders and the other, and we also have the red-backed salamanders. Okay, we keep track now of everything that we have on iNaturalist. We too have a project which is called Fishers Island Diversity. And if you're ever interested in knowing if anything is there, everything is here and recorded. We're starting a dragonfly. We have a, because of all our ponds, we have dragonflies. And one of the unique things about Fishers Island is that, and it has always been this way, is that all around the island you wind up seeing really large insects. You know, the Io butterfly that's there in the corner, he was on the, uh, in my shower at my house. And the, uh, this fellow, whose name I don't well pronounce, was uh, on the front lawn of the museum. Stag beetles and things are around and they're easy to see. All right, we also have, you find also a lot of caterpillars at every size and shape. Interestingly enough, these, I didn't even know we had the uh, monarch butterfly caterpillars, but I had nurtured two marsh uh, milkweeds to put into a, to a, a reconstructed area. And so I waited, I've raised them all summer. I put them in on August 30th. When I went back September 1st, this is what was left of them. And all these caterpillars that I didn't even know were around had stripped one completely and then eventually destroyed the other. This is probably our best caterpillar, which is called the hickory horn devil, which we found in one of our marine grasslands. It's about six inches long. It's a fabulous sight. It eats uh, winged zumac. We also have, of course, many damp wood areas where we have tons of mushrooms. And all the rare plants and everything were found by the New York Natural Heritage Program, who did this amazing thing. You know, we had 65 rare plants in our records, and they were able to find 35 of them. They only found two small mammals, but they did, using uh, recordings, find six species of bats, they think. But the vocalizations weren't clear enough to uh, identify two. Here are some of the actual rare plants. The lick grass lady tress is a true orchid. For one, New York State's very few ones. We have a big rocky intertidal space, and to maintain our grasslands, we burn things quite often. We also battle, of course, all the invasives. All right, well, thank you very much for letting me present to you today. Do you have any spotted lanternfly yet? Have you seen any spot spotted lanternfly at all out there? No, and what we've been doing is eliminating, once we realized that it was going to be a problem, we had a profusion of those, uh, you know, the, the trees, the, uh, the, what is it, the, uh, that uh, Chinese stink tree or whatever it is. And so we began removing them from everywhere they occur. You know, it's very hard to get to, which is part of the charm. You know, it's one of the reasons that when you go to the beaches on the south, there's just not a lot of pollution. You know, you can snorkel there and see eight feet to the bottom. You know, it's, it's good that way. But, you know, it's us, right? It's population that causes all the difficulties. So thank you very much.